Well, good afternoon, and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm Robert Litvak, the Center's Senior Vice President. Uh, today is another in the Books at Wilson series, in which we're delighted to launch Fearing the Worst, How Korea Transformed the Cold War by Samuel F. Wells, Jr. This path-breaking book, which Harvard's Graham Allison has called a masterful study, is the capstone of Sam's distinguished career, of which, of which the Wilson Center was his home for over four decades. Sharing in today's celebration is Sam's family. Sherry, his wife of 50 years to whom the book is dedicated, his daughter Lauren, and his son Christopher, and his wife Fariba. I also would like to acknowledge uh, uh, Jane Harmon, who will be joining us, um, who has provided special leadership in expanding the center's focus on Korea. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the Hyundai Motor Korea Foundation Center for Korean History and Public Policy. Sam has played a vital role in the history of the Wilson Center. He initially came in the mid-70s as a Wilson Fellow on leave from his professorship at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and went on to join the staff, founding the International Security Studies Program and serving as the center's deputy director. It was his Harvard doctoral supervisor, the late er Professor Ernest May, who introduced Sam to the arts of using history to analyze issues of current public policy and specifically to the multinational study of security problems. Thanks to Sam's pioneering work, that approach, using history as a tool of policy analysis, is now central to the mission of the Wilson Center and our branding. And the book we are proud to launch today is Policy Relevant Scholarship at its Finest. The first time I encountered Sam's name was as a graduate student reading the fall 1979 issue of Harvard's premier journal, International Security. Uh, and if you'll permit a personal parenthetical, not long after that, I met Sam and he hired me as a fresh postdoc. 36 years later, I remain grateful for that offer and his mentorship. Sam's article in International Security was titled, Sounding the Toxin, NSC 68 and the Soviet Threat. It was a seminal article, which focused on the then just declassified top secret policy document of the Truman administration, which advocated for a large expansion in the US military budget. Uh, but Sam's brilliant analysis, as he acknowledged at the time, was hamstrung by the obvious constraint. He only had access to Ameri the American documentary record. Fortuitously, the end of the Cold War created an opportunity to overcome uh, what the distinguished Yale historian John Gaddis has called clapping with one hand analysis uh, by tapping the post-Soviet and East Bloc archives. Sam worked with Gaddis and a team of distinguished Cold War historians to found the Cold War International History Project at the Wilson Center, which is now one of the Wilson Center's crown jewels and headed by Christian Osterman. Thanks to that project, the center is now the repository of thousands of translated Cold War documents on its website. This remarkable resource, resource which uh, is transforming our understanding of the Cold War, can be accessed online at digitalarchive.wilsoncenter.org. Forty years after the publication of his international security article, Sam's work has come full circle. Sam ta tapped documents from Russia, China, and North Korea in previously closed archives to have now written a truly international history. The Korean War has been recognized by scholars as a Cold War crucible. It proved to be a pivotal event in the early history of the Cold War. In Fearing the Worst, Sam explains how the Korean War fundamentally transformed the, the post-war competition between the United States and the Soviet Union into a militarized confrontation that would last decades. 
Today's meeting will be conversational. I'll pose a series of questions, allowing Sam to elucidate the main themes of his book. After a half hour or so, I'll invite questions from the floor. After the meeting, books will be available for purchase and inscription by the author, and I'd, I'd invite you to join us for reception in the center's adjacent boardroom. So as that, let's begin at the obvious starting point. Sam, um, what is the principal message of your book, and can you unpack the title, Fearing the Worst, for us? Well, in a sense, you've stepped on my answer by uh, giving uh, what is the main conclusion, which is that the Cold War was a political and economic contest before Korea, and afterwards it took on a very different nature. Uh, in the article that Rob quite kindly mentioned on sounding the toxin, I was very critical of the authors of that article, principally Paul Nitza, who was the head of the special group that drafted it. And I thought the recommendations they made for a massive military buildup were excessive. Uh, reading the Soviet and Chinese documents and the cable correspondence, mm. reports from Beijing about what Mao was saying, reports from Pyongyang about what Kim was saying to diplomats, uh, made me realize that the commitment of the Soviet and Chinese leaders, not to mention the North Koreans, which were completely devoted to trying to capture the whole peninsula for communism, uh, the commitment of the three communist states engaged in the war, their willingness to take risk was much higher than I had anticipated. So Washington was responding to things that happened in Korea that they had neither anticipated nor desired to join. They responded. They really had a very severe shock with the Chinese intervention in October of 1950, which is the critical turning point in the war. And at that point, they feared the country was on the edge of World War III. And it's that fearing the worst, the worst case, that uh, is the principal argument and therefore the title of the book. Great. Um, you have a lot of new materials on the origins of the Korean War. As you've now pieced this together from a multinational perspective, perspectives, um, what was the driving factor in starting the war? Well, I've got a few photographs from the book that I will try to toggle through here if I can get my fingers to work. While you do that, I just want to welcome those participating in today's meeting via C-SPAN. Well, that's not coming up on the screen for some reason, so we'll move on here. Uh, the initiative for the war came from Kim Il-sung, the dictator of North Korea, who on multiple occasions requested permission from Stalin to invade the South, and with that permission would have to come the supplies, the equipment, the advisors that were necessary to bring off a successful offensive. Uh, after refusing many of these requests or ignoring them, Stalin changed his mind and cabled Kim Il-sung on January 30th, 1950, saying, I invite you to come to Moscow to discuss with me the operation that you have wanted to operate, the operation you've wanted to launch in the invasion of South Korea. He didn't spell that out. His language was very sparse, but that was clearly what he meant. Now, thanks. Okay. Uh, 
this is a photograph of Stalin in the middle, Mao, Khrushchev, and all the leaders of the communist states gathered for Stalin's 70th birthday. This is in the Bolshoi Theater. And it occurs December 21st, 1949. Stalin uh, had invited Mao to come and discuss a treaty of assistance and alliance. Mao made his first trip outside the country, was very upset. Uh, Mao doesn't have very many photographs available. He didn't like photographs of himself. He's never smiling, which may have something to do with the fact that he had black teeth. Uh, but here he is looking uh, not like a necessarily happy camper at uh, the Bolshoi Theater. Uh, the negotiations dragged on for two months. They would lead to a treaty, but uh, at this point Mao was not getting the concessions that he wanted. And finally, at some point in late January 1950, Stalin changes his mind and he conceptualizes a, a new strategy. No longer would he try and keep all of the concessions that he had taken from what we used to call Chiang Kai-shek, uh, now Zhang Jishi, uh, in the current transliteration. He was prepared to give many of those up to Mao. He was prepared to endorse the North Korean invasion on the condition that he keep the Soviet Union out of the war, and on the basis of a plan he had to force Mao, persuade, coerce, however one wants to style it, into providing the backup for the North Koreans if things didn't go as expected and lead to a rapid North Korean victory. So Stalin comes up with this new strategy, this new strategic concept. He makes the concessions to Mao, and without telling Mao anything about his planning, he wasn't in the habit of explaining himself to anyone, certainly not to people he saw as client state leaders. Uh, he cables, before the negotiations are even completed, he cables Kim, come to Moscow. So, I mean, that's that's the, the way in which uh, it came about. And uh, one of the big questions has always been, why did Stalin change? And essentially, it's because he was blocked in his ambitions to break up NATO in Western Europe. The Americans, Truman and Atchison in January, had made it fairly clear that they were consolidating U.S. interests in Asia. and they laid out a defense perimeter for the United States that did not include Taiwan or South Korea. So communist analysts said, okay, this means they won't defend. Well, that was not necessarily the assumption made in Washington, but they just weren't going to be part of the defensive perimeter. So uh, that's why Stalin decides he can go in at a low cost. What's really striking that a um, territory that the United States was not willing to stake out as a commitment and declaratory policy, it felt compelled to go to war over, you know, some months later after the attack occurred. When it did occur, and there was that initial uh, uh, North Korean success, but ultimately it proved unsuccessful. Can you talk a bit about how it played out and, and, and why uh, the North Korean invasion ultimately proved unsuccessful? Well, you need to know a little bit about uh, Kim Il-sung, and as you can see in this photograph in which he is announcing the start of the war, he's very young, he's 38 years old, and he is put in power by the Soviet political advisors and security services in North Korea. He has great ambitions, but they're completely dependent on Soviet support. 
uh, he promised Stalin and he promised Mao whose permission and endorsement he had to get and Mao gave it that he would win the war in a week. He was counting on South Koreans not being prepared, which they weren't. He was counting on a revolt in South Korea of 200,000 communists whom he had cultivated and expected to rise up and take over the central part of the country. Well, things didn't work out. Now, he was also counting that the U.S. would not intervene. So both of his assumptions were not realized. There was no revolt. His initial offensive got bogged down because of very timid leadership, very poor use of tanks and artillery. And he was not making much progress after capturing Seoul in four days. And on the second day of the invasion, the United States announced a plan to intervene, which upset his other fundamental assumption. So uh, not only did the United States intervene, it quickly won the support of the fledgling Security Council of the United Nations. And a number of allied countries said that they would come forward and join the United States in supporting the UN resolution to restore peace and security in Korea. Now the question comes up, why did Truman reverse his previous thinking? And again, I think there are a number of reasons to support that. He was very upset at the Soviets using what we would today call proxy forces, the North Koreans, to expand his area of influence. There were loud complaints of, we're now vulnerable for coming from West Germany and from other countries in Europe that felt that they were allied and what would happen if Stalin turned to the West again and began aggression against the Western countries. And finally, there were the charges of Senator Joseph McCarthy, who had for five months been claiming the Truman administration was soft on communism. They were harboring communists in the State Department and elsewhere in the federal government, and they should be impeached for treason. If that has some contemporary rings, why, so be it. Um, turned out there actually were a couple of communists in the State Department, but uh, that's another story. Anyway, that, that's what happened to the North Korean invasion and why the United States was a key part of each of these countries having to recalibrate their mm -hmm. strategies. Well, just to follow on from that, just a, a quick follow-on question, Sam, uh, before turning to the U.S. military buildup. Um, there were mis miscalculations on both sides. I mean, m you mentioned Kim miscalculated that the United States was not going to enter, into, uh, enter the war given that the U.S. had previously not uh, designated South Korea as part of a defense perimeter, it was a just kind of an understandable, in some respects, uh, assumption. Then U.S. war aims changed from just kind of status quo ante, like going back to the 38th parallel. They drive to the Yalu River. Can you just talk a little bit? You have a whole discussion on the, on the kind of Yalu River decision. Was there a sense that that the war could escalate, it would draw the Chinese in, or what, what was the underlying assumption that, that, that we could, you could have American forces on the Chinese border without the Chinese responding? Well, the, the backdrop of this is that the United States had no human intelligence from the Russian sources, none on North Koreans, none on the Chinese, what happened is there were a series of informed, or not very well informed, guesses made by political leaders and the leaders of the fairly new Central Intelligence Agency. And they assumed the Chinese were too weak. Mm -hmm. They assumed the Soviets did not want a war, they weren't prepared for it, which was in fact correct. Stalin was throughout all of this very cautious, careful not to get directly invade, uh, involved uh, with Soviet forces. Um, and MacArthur, who was 
at the end of his career had had a very successful time, uh, had been the commander in the Far East. Korea was not part of his mandate until the war broke out, and then he immediately was responsible for supervising the uh, offensive operations there. Uh, MacArthur planned and overrode any opposition and made a very successful amphibious envelopment at Incheon. Mm. And this is MacArthur, uh, the first regional commander ever to go to the front during the dangerous operation of an amphibious landing against the defended beach. And here he is with his uh, lieutenants uh, watching the invasion in what is clearly a staged photograph. Uh, huh. Arthur, you got Ridgeway in there, and you've got a whole section, a biographical section on Ridgeway in the yeah, book, which yeah, is fascinating. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, MacArthur is being propped up here by the medics and others because the night before the start of the landing, the tail end of a hurricane hit the invading force. He was had a notoriously nervous stomach, got very seasick, and the uh, his top aide and the medics gave him half a bottle of scotch <laughs> as a solution. So he got up the next morning and somehow ate a hearty breakfast and showed up on the bridge to watch the invasion. Well, he had taken what he styled himself as a 5,000 to one gamble and won. And in the debate about whether you cross the 38th parallel, mm -hmm. whether you try to unify all of Korea, uh, Atchison and Harriman both stated later in their memoirs the sentiment was so great to finish the operation that nobody could withstand MacArthur's insistence that he wanted to pursue the North Korean forces all the way to China. He assumed the Chinese were in no shape to invade. What gets worse is that he even assumed when the Chinese sent their volunteers in, and some of the Americans who had been advisors in the Chinese Civil War identified Chinese people by their units in the Chinese People's Volunteers, even though they were wearing North Korean uniforms, sent this intelligence back. MacArthur and his intelligence chief dismissed it. Mm. So they were hell-bent going for the Yalu River border mm -hmm. at a time when the Chinese had infiltrated at night 380,000 troops into North Korea and set a trap for the advancing American forces. Now it's, it's, it's a fascinating uh, you know, episode. And uh, um, to quote a, a contemporary U.S. general, uh, the enemy gets a vote too. So if you decide you're crossing the 38th parallel march on, on their border, um, uh, taking into account a response uh, would, would, would have been prudent. I think what's one of the great strengths of, of, of your book is how you really meticulously go through the decision making and you look from all the different perspectives, unpacking what were the threshold assumptions that drive different policy prescriptions. And if I can just kind of hyperlink from that to the mission of the Wilson Center. I mean, that's what we do in a host of different regional contexts, uh, whether it's the Iran nuclear deal or um, uh, looking at, at Russia, Ukraine now. Like, what are the, what are the perspectives of the different actors to the, to the best you can glean them, given that you're dealing with opaque societies uh, in, in, in many cases, in some cases anyway? Um, what are the threshold assumptions and how valid are those? Critically assess some kind of policy hygiene. I think this is a wonderful kind of example of that. Uh, drawing on, on the available historical material. Let's pivot to um, uh, the next question, which I think really goes to the heart of your argument about the tr transformative um, uh, um, consequences of the Korean War for the Cold War and what led to the U.S. military buildup. Well, <laughs> following the Chinese intervention, it took several weeks for the overwhelming combat intelligence from a fleeing set of units 
to be digested and to realize this was a serious Chinese intervention. That shook the decision makers in Washington and uh, they, as I say, really feared World War III was on the table and Truman entered in his diary. I think World War III is here. Uh, they made two basic decisions coming out of a month-long strategic review, which was led in very large part by Dean Acheson here with Truman uh, and by uh, General George Marshall, who had been called back to be the Secretary of Defense. And they decided Europe is our first priority. It is the first objective of Soviet aggression. And what we need to do in this case is build up our nuclear and conventional forces for the defense of Europe. Mm -hmm. This means we will have a limited war in Korea. We will not send any more forces beyond replacements for those who are killed and wounded to MacArthur. We will recover the military initiative and get just above the 38th parallel and call for ceasefire and negotiations at that point. So this is mm -hmm. the new American strategy. At the same time, they endorsed the military buildup to support the defense of Europe and the ability to protect American interests more broadly. And what this involved is a quadrupling of the defense budget, which is laid out in some detail in the book, uh, an expansion of the Strategic Air Command, doubling the number of long-range bombers that we had from roughly 520 to 1,082 by 1954, sending four additional divisions of troops to Europe, naming Dwight Eisenhower as a Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, transforming the NATO alliance into a really functioning defensive alliance with war planning sections and commitment of forces and so forth. So there's a huge buildup, including a massive expansion of the CIA with the largest part of the expansion going to covert operations. So uh, it's the Chinese intervention mm -hmm. that triggers the review, which produces mm -hmm. limited war and also produces a commitment inside the government that there would be no first use of nuclear weapons right. and then this massive mm -hmm. conventional and nuclear buildup focused primarily on Europe. And you approvingly quote and have as your epigraph the quote from uh, Ambassador Bolin, um, it was the Korean War and not World War II that made us a world military political power. I think that's this sort of um, relationship between the Korean War and, and the buildup that you just spoke to and which you kind of addressed in your NSC 68 art, the Sounding the Toxin article, you really brought the argument to um, its fullness uh, th through these, these international archives. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, to me, as, as uh, um, a fresh uh, you know, interpretation of these events and really kind of speaks to the kind of path-breaking quality of, of, of your research here, Sam. Um, I can't resist. You've got Tupolev's photo up there. Um, while all this was going on on the American side, do you want to just say a word about what was going on, on the Soviet side? I mean, because they wanted to talk about how they were scrambling to develop kind of their counterpart capabilities and the ability to threaten the U.S. homeland. Well, we did not discover this for a long time, but the Russians had started the development of a long-range bomber in 1942. Uh, they didn't need it for World War II, but they were thinking about for after the war. They saw the British and American use of bombing in World War II. They wanted to have a comparable capability. They also started, within a couple of months after they started the bomber program, a program on nuclear weapons. Now, neither of these got full funding because the Soviets were fighting for their lives against the Nazis at this point. The first task was creating the equipment and the manpower and the strategic momentum to defeat 
Nazi Germany. And they did that. And immediately after the war, they started to put more resources in 19, early 1946 into the bomber program and the uh, nuclear program. With the Korean War, they greatly expanded both of these programs, but they kept encountering technological difficulties. Uh, Andrei Tupolev was their leader in long-range aircraft manufacture and design. And he had uh, multiple research teams working with him. They had lots of resources. Uh, they had trouble with the technology. They had trouble with electronics. They had trouble getting the engines developed with adequate power that could uh, go the range to get a bomb to the United States. Uh, the nuclear program did somewhat better in terms of efficiency. They had even greater technological problems, but the nuclear program, which was uh, run by Igor Khrushchev with a team of people in secret cities in the center of the uh, Soviet Union uh, down toward the Caucasus, they had uh, assistance from an extensive espionage network at Los Alamos and Oak Ridge that told them what the Americans were doing to develop their bombs, how, uh, what type of materials they used, uh, how they structured the triggering devices, et cetera. Uh, estimations are that uh, some of our colleagues have made is that uh, the espionage probably saved the Soviet nuclear scientists 18 months in developing a bomb. And of course, they had their first explosion in August of 1949. And it's that explosion that first raised the specter of a Soviet threat to the continental United States and led to Paul Nitsa and the NS-68 crew making the arguments for a buildup that they did. So uh, you have great anecdotes about how Stalin, they had a couple B-29s that had come to uh, Siberia uh, and Stalin said, just replicate it exactly. And when they put it together, they included ashtrays, uh, which I guess were not permitted, I ironically or, or whatever, in the Soviet, in the Red Air Force. And they closed them off, but they figured they had to, I, to, to mimic it exactly. So, well, this is an yeah. indication of how yeah. terrified they were of, yeah. of Stalin's. He said, I want this airplane copied yeah. in every detail. And they did it, including building the ashtrays and sealing them. Yeah. Well, for Kurchatov and Tupolev, I mean, uh, talk about all of us can identify having supervisors and, and pressures from that. Imagine having Stalin and Beria as your supervisors running these big projects, <laughs> which leads me to a uh, uh, um, final question before we open it up uh, to uh, – we have a great group of uh, – in the audience of, of historians and others uh, um, who are knowledgeable about th this era and, and look forward to their questions. Um, what surprises did you discover during your research, Sam? Well, as I indicated, I started off, of course, with the experience in the Western archives and thought the Korean War was one that we were not prepared for, did not function very well in combat, uh, got surprised by the Chinese, and overbuilt our military as a result. Uh, what changed my interpretation was really the information in the new communist archives and memoirs. Uh, turns out that Soviet and Chinese generals like to write their memoirs and their population likes to read them. Uh, sometimes they remain unpublished for a period of time, but they've been written. Some of them by the Chinese, for example, were written uh, while they were under house arrest during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, but these documents persuaded me that the degree of commitment and risk demonstrated by leaders in Moscow and Beijing in their attempt to drive U.S. and allied forces out of Korea was in fact a worst case. And uh, that ultimately all the human and financial resources that Moscow put into the effort and the Chinese sacrificing almost a total of 900,000 casualties 
in the war, uh, made the worst case justified and the U.S. military buildup justified, I would have been more positive about the type of the buildup if more sustained attention had been given to ground forces and a little less to the Strategic Air Command, as General Marshall had in fact recommended on leaving the Defense Department. But the Air Force then and now has a great public relations operation, which extends well into Congress, and uh, they won a series of battles of the budget going through the 50s. And uh, when the cutback came with Eisenhower, they kept most of what they had in the Army. Navy and the Marines are the ones that got cut back. Well, now uh, it's my pleasure to open the floor to questions. Um, let's go first to Bob Hathaway, who is the former director of the Asia program at the Wilson Center, and also uh, we'll call him Dr. Robert Hathaway because he got his PhD with Sam Wells as a supervisor. So over to you, Bob. Uh, thanks, Rob. And you can turn the tables. You had a, you had a dissertation defense. Now you can ask Sam a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think his questions were harder than mine. <laughs> uh, but Sam, congratulations. Uh, those of us who have been fortunate enough to know you for a while are immensely pleased uh, to see the publication of this book because we know, knew, and know um, just how terribly important. Um, it's going to be for our understanding of, of this period of history. Um, I want to ask you uh, another question about your title, Fearing the Worst. Um, you have suggested um, that a lot of serious people, knowledgeable people, really did think that World War III was imminent. Um, fortunately, they were wrong. Uh, why were they wrong? Was it because they had erroneous assumptions about the other side, or was it because key decisions in a variety of capitals, not simply just in one capital, uh, key decisions were made so that World War III was avoided, or was it some combination of misassumptions and uh, deliberate actions? Well, it's a combination, as you would imagine, from a variety of sources. First and foremost, I would say we, our leaders, feared the worst because they had very poor intelligence. And your inclination when the intelligence you're relying on is proven wrong in several instances, you tend to think, I have to disregard what I'm hearing and think the worst. Because if I'm not prepared for the worst, I'm going to get surprised again. And that was very much at play, that they realized they could not trust the information they were getting. And in this huge expansion of the CIA, where the amount of money and the amount of foreign contract spies that the CIA put out in Eastern Europe, China, North Korea, doubled by six or seven times. Yet virtually all of these people were either killed upon arrival in the country or turned and started sending reports written by their captors back to us as intelligence. So we not only had sort of a negative of useful intelligence, we had a, a, a negative of disinformation coming back, pretending to be intelligence. So we had good reason not to be very confident. But, I mean, the Soviets, for example, found that technological progress was a lot harder than they expected. They couldn't make their deadlines. Uh, they couldn't separate uh, uranium from all of the dirty minerals that were in the uranium ore. Uh, they couldn't uh, make other technological processes uh, work effectively took them. They had to, do, to invent new processes and then build the plants to do it. The North Koreans were uh, hopelessly ambitious and underprepared. 
uh, the Chinese were carried away by essentially Mao's bounding ambition to be the communist leader in Asia. And he was willing to sacrifice all manner of people, equipment, and so forth. But his commander in the field, uh, uh, a plain uh, soldier who had grown up in a farming peasant family, Ping Dehua, uh, kept saying, we cannot fight on anymore. We're losing hundreds of thousands of people per month. And uh, she eventually said, we have to draw this to a conclusion. And of course, the, the, the war was brought to a conclusion by uh, the death of Stalin and the incoming Soviet leadership deciding, enough, we'll call it quits here and accept a negotiated settlement best we can get in negotiations at Pyongyang. But there was a period when the worst really appeared possible. After General Ridgway, as I discuss, restores morale and starts going back, uh, members of Congress say, well, why do we need to keep funding this program? We we're now moving into North Korea again, and we, we, we've got enough equipment and weapons and so forth. Uh, the administration at that point, I think, kept arguing worst case and the battle over the 1951 budget has them really stretching their arguments beyond what I believe they really thought because that was the only way they could get the Republicans to vote the funds. And some of the Democrats. Remember, this was a time when a large group of Southern Democrats only at election time acted Democratic. The rest of the time they voted with Republicans. So um, there was a problem. Good. Uh, with that, I'll ask our resident expert on Congress, Don Wolfensberger, in the back. Sir, Miss, actually, all the way in the back, Don Wolfensberger. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for your book. Uh, this is the Korean War. It was the first war I remembered as an eight-year-old, and uh, MacArthur was one of my early heroes. But <laughs> studying the history of the war a little later, I keep running into Truman, I believe, insisting that this would be called a UN police action. And as you mentioned, the UN did sanction the intervention there. But was this done to really avoid Congress declaring war or to also highlight the fact that we did have other allies involved with us in you know, fighting the, the North Koreans? Can you give us a little background on that? Well, there's a fair amount of literature on it. I didn't go into it in the book uh, because it doesn't really bear on the conduct of the war or strategic decisions. But Atchison and one or two other people in the White House staff urged the president when he had strong Republican support uh, at the start of the war to uh, get a congressional endorsement. And he refused because he thought it was going to be a short war. He really believed it would be a police action and to his dismay found out otherwise. And he had some lawyers who told him he didn't need that authority. That, and I think uh, one of our earliest fellows in the uh, International Security Studies program was Robert Donovan, the uh, former prize-winning political reporter for the old New York Herald Tribune, who did a two-volume biography of MacArthur and went into this aspect with a, a great deal of uh, detail. Uh, and he, he said that uh, Truman simply didn't want to give the Republicans a chance to put conditions on troop limits and start meddling in strategy because they had been asked to approve a war in advance, and he chose to accept the legal interpretation that the president's authority to defend the country was sufficient. Uh, so uh, it, it is, I think most scholars now agree, one of the more serious mistaken precedents that Truman set. Hmm. Yes, uh, John Lampy. Uh, hang on a second, John. There's a microphone coming to you former head of our Wilson Center's East European Studies Program. 
And uh, as, as, as I always speak of Eastern Europe, there I was in Bulgaria in 1966 and 67 uh, with the anniversary of the start of the Korean War when South Korea invaded North Korea, as the Bulgarian press announced, and then North Korea had, had to respond. Uh, and, uh, of course, one brief question, Bruce Cummings may have entertained this at, at one point, what, was there any sort of small North Korean effort to show that, in fact, they were responding to some kind of attack? That's, that's a minor point. A major point, I think, uh, speaking of the technological problems that the Soviet side was having, in fearing the worst was part of the American buildup uh, connected to a misestimate of how much uh, nuclear capacity the, the, the Soviets uh, really had in, in the early 1950s? Both, both, both good questions. Uh, the original plan for the invasion, which was developed by the North Koreans, the Soviet advisors didn't like it, and they completely revised it. And Stalin said, you don't just invade a country, you set up a pretext that you are the victim. And so there has to be a, an incident that is simulated of a South Korean attack, and you respond to it. So all this plan was worked out. It was going to be a very secret invasion. But then the information about the invasion and the clearing away of civilians from the border region reached some communists in Japan some Japanese told the American officials in Japan, and so the North Koreans began to realize that their secrecy had been blown. So they made a slight feint to start off and delayed their overall attack by a few hours and then responded to that feint with an all-front invasion. Now, in this picture, if you read the text of Kim Il-sung's speech announcing the war, he says he's responding to a South Korean attack. That's what is in, in the declaration. And that continued to be the line that worked its way into communist and satellite histories. So now on the other point about the uh, nuclear, uh, in our intelligence estimates, to my surprise, the CIA, on the basis of fairly crude calculations, based on the amount of fissionable material that could possibly be produced by the size of plants we thought were operating, and the Soviets had a couple of plants we didn't even know about, the CIA estimate of the number of bombs that they would have was very close to what the stockpile was in 1954. Uh, so, good marks for however you came up with it, but there it is. On estimating bomber strength, we misread that. Uh, not so much at CIA, but Air Force Intelligence misread it, and this is part of the battle of the budget. They wanted to emphasize the rapid size and growth of the types and aircraft, so they they categorized an airplane that looked really nice, but it was built in a hurry to try and get an all-jet bomber. And they built 20 of them to start with. And when they started testing them, six of the first seven crashed in tests. And the test pilots showed an understandable reluctance to fly the rest. And Air Force Intelligence said they've got this great new bomber, and we started building against that bomber, which had been shown in an air show uh, on the May Day Parade. So, I mean, it's a combination of things. We considerably overestimated their bomber strength and capabilities. Hmm. Yes, um, in, in the back, and if speakers could please identify, yes, ma'am. Identify themselves, please. Yeah. Hi, my name's Judy Bello, and my earliest connection with Sam was that back in Chapel Hill, he introduced me to the man who became my husband, 
So we go way back, and I have the deepest respect for him. Sam, here's my question. Um, you have mentioned several things that may be part of your answer. You've mentioned, as a result of the Korean engagement, um, a buildup of U the U.S. military, the buildup of intelligence, especially covert operations, and the facilitation of limited war. But the bottom line is, why and when did Korea go to the top of your to-do list to, of books to write, since you're expert on diplomacy, north, south, east, and west? Well, it was actually the opportunity, uh, given the records we had been able to collect, to, in one of the first cases that I know of, tell both sides of a major international incident that has continuing resonance in the policy arena. Uh, there just, you could name probably on one hand the number of cases where we have foreign records that you can sit down and say, here's what Stalin was saying to Kim, here's what he was saying to Mao, and what they were planning to do. Because the Chinese, for example, are very pleased and have been for many years at their performance in the Korean War. They have written a six-volume official history of the war in Korea, uh, of the war to defeat imperialism, as they style it. And it gives chapter and verse. Uh, it's their big victory. So uh, there's a lot of material there. Now, these things that we've collected and that we've seen and have scholars have some of our Chinese colleagues have gone through a lot of records in the defense ministry and other places that foreigners couldn't see. But they've written about it and we've got their books. Those records are now closed to us and to them. Uh, same in, in Russia. So we, we've got sort of a, a one-time chance in this case to tell the whole story. And uh, that, <clears throat> that seemed uh, both very interesting and uh, an opportunity that could tease out how things that began there, uh, the Sino-Soviet split, the commitment of the United States to no first use, the Korean drive, North Korean drive for nuclear weapons program, which the Russians kept putting off and putting off, but finally agreed to support, and a range of other things that, that go right back to uh, this period in the early 50s. So it seemed like a good way to uh, stop bothering my colleagues at the center since I'd retired and uh, stay off the streets. <laughs> and, and the book has uh, tremendous you know, contemporary you know, resonance because the armistice of the Korean War, you know, persists. There's no peace treaty. Um, the major powers that you address, Russia, China, the United States, um, kind of a uh, uh, revived South Korea and Japan are part through the six party talks have been involved with, with North Korea. The methodology, you know, that that uh, is used to um, um, estimate the size of the North Korean nuclear arsenal is pretty much what you described, which is looking at facilities and then making estimates of how much weapons usable material they can produce, uh, leading to the um, size of the uh, of estimates about the the arsenal. Um, so there's tremendous kind of contemporary relevance that one can tease out of out of your historical analysis here. Who will be next? Um, yeah, Sujin Park. Thank you, Thank you Rob. Um, um, listening to your remarks, it's, it was as somebody, somebody looking at and analyzing the Korean Peninsula stalemate and issue, it was very striking to uh, find the semblance uh, between the circumstances back in 1950 and probably today, 70 years later, where the Korean Peninsula has a very strategic, uh, uh, geographical and political uh, significance, not just uh, in the region, but on the world. And with your title being, you know, fearing the worst, um, now with North Korea with its advanced nuclear weapons uh, program, a mass destruction, uh, 
the situation has become even more you know, serious. So uh, I'd like to ask what uh, s implications of, uh, because President Trump has been emphasizing uh, the, his willingness and interest to withdraw troops from the Korean Peninsula, how that would, even if it didn't happen now, but his uh, continued mentioning of it would have on, on you know, future um, situation, uh, c considering the Atchison line did not include the Korean Peninsula, South Korea? Well, I think you know as well as I do, having worked on these things in Seoul, uh, that our current president has divined a way to make virtually every international relationship we have worse. Uh, the To start an engagement with the North Koreans by having personal diplomacy with Kim Jong-un is giving away one of the most valued assets that we had to offer uh, in recognizing this young, unproven leader and essentially acknowledging the status of North Korea as a nuclear state at the same time. Uh, and now, of course, he, through his supposed tariff uh, sanctions operations, uh, he's managed to alienate both your government in Seoul and the Japanese in the process and make it appear that the United States is the unreliable ally. So uh, I'm not uh, optimistic that the situation will improve, but I agree with what uh, my colleague Rob has been saying for some months, that it's highly unlikely the North Koreans are going to even accept any serious reduction or cap on their nuclear weapons program. And uh, the talk about denuclearization uh, is as much for an uninformed audience in the rest of the world as uh, it is for the North Koreans. And so I, I really uh, am not optimistic about where we're headed there unless there's a significant change in uh, the political arrangements in Washington. Uh, Ross Johnson. Sam, thank you very much. Um, could you go back to um, your understanding of Stalin's decision um, to support and, and uh, um, assist the, um, the North Korean invasion in so many ways? Um, a high-risk decision, which is very uncharacteristic of Stalin in, in the late 40s, up to 50, um, quite in contrast to his conservatism in Europe, his uh, great concern that Tito was trying to force him into um, confrontations in Trieste, in the Greek Civil War, and so on. It seems uncharacteristic um, for, for Stalin to be risk-taking to that extent, and I wonder if you could, if you could help, help us understand a bit more. I, kn I know you, you mentioned it, but is there, is there any, any more uh, that helps in terms of the context? I think part of it has to do with his frustration with Mao and the fact that Mao simply would not uh, give in to the insistence of Stalin and his negotiators that Russia keep all the concessions from Yalta uh, with regard to Chinese rights, railroads, territories, and so forth. Uh, he, I mean, the, the, the Chinese, even though they didn't have many cards to play, implicitly understood that Stalin did not want another Tito. And so Mao played the I could go my own way card uh, a little bit, not, not a lot. But when the Soviets finally agreed to, initially, Stalin wouldn't even agree to negotiations with Mao. 
Uh, Mao, Mao was the key thing in turning around the Korean invasion promise. And he finally agreed to negotiate, and Mao called Zhou Enlai from Beijing to come with a negotiating team. And Zhou, who is every bit as Henry Kissinger paints him as the most brilliant diplomat he's engaged with, uh, sat down and rewrote a massive Soviet draft treaty with his team in 48 hours, rejecting all the concessions, taking them over for China, and essentially having a total Chinese draft for this thing. And they went in and presented it to the Soviets, who immediately adjourned that meeting and had to consult with Beria, Stalin, uh, Molotov. And uh, two days later, the Soviets come back and agree to almost everything. But there is, in the archives, a copy of the draft that Joe and Lai submitted in which, according to Russian experts, of which I am not one, Stalin made marginal notations in his infamous blue pencil, curse words up and down, striking out clauses, everything. So he was obviously, on initial reading, bent out of shape, but folded, because he came up, as I argue, this new concept in which the risk would be assumed by Mao. And uh, so that's what I refer to as his reinsurance treaty. So. We're going to take um, two more questions, that gentleman and then that gentleman, and then we'll adjourn. Uh, thank you. Uh, Neil Chen from George Washington University. Uh, speaking of Chinese, I want to ask a question about Chinese decision on going to North Korea. Because what we know is uh, Chinese leaders start to debate about whether go to North Korea fight against the United States from uh, June 1950 to October 1950. But I'm wondering, uh, instead instead of going to war or not, is there any uh, other options that Chinese leader was thinking, like uh, giving up North Korea or trying to use another way to save North Korea? Well, there there, there is a debate and a few members of the Politburo, uh, in the end, come around only reluctantly. But Mao himself, from things that uh, people like Professor Xin Jihua have come up with, uh, decided in mid-July that China would have to intervene. And that's why he sends several hundred thousand troops to Manchuria starting in July of 1950. Uh, and then he has a campaign of persuasion to bring around a large number of the uh, other members of the Politburo. He never does bring uh, all of them around. Lin Biao was never in favor of this. but. Uh, what Mao does is, in the first week of October, is a sustained three-day meeting of the Politburo, which I suspect you've read about. And Mao almost has everybody's support. And the question is, that the Americans at this point are really, and with their UN allies, South Koreans, are approaching the, uh, the, the border. Uh, at the Yalu, uh, Mao calls Ping Dehua, who had been the head of this northeast border army, back to Beijing, meets with him privately and says, do you understand my logic? Will you support me? Ping says yes. So they have a new meeting the next morning, and Ping makes a impassioned statement saying, we will have to fight the Americans sooner or later. It's much better to fight them in Korea than on Chinese soil, when our cities could be bombed and our uh, industry ruined. Uh, 
and he was all in favor of it. The troops were there, they were ready to go. And that carried the vote, and they started to go in, but then they get a message back from Zhou Enlai, who's in Moscow trying to negotiate massive arms and weapons uh, supplies for the really un under-equipped Chinese force. He says, Stalin has gone back on his promise of providing air cover for our troops. And so Politburo says, oh, wait a minute. So they halt and hold decisions for 48 hours. And then Mao decides, we can't wait for Stalin. He's going to have to bail us out sooner or later. We're going. So he goes back, gets the authorization, and then they start ordering the troops to move in the night of October 19th. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a back and forth. Mao never wavered. It was a question of timing. Uh, he was determined that the United States would it resolve, have to be resolved by conflict. He wanted the conflict to be on neighboring territory, not Chinese territory. So, mm. Last question, gentlemen. I'm Kevin Lee from LS School of International Affairs. My question is that uh, in 1951, Commander uh, Marcel uh, Richway had already reversed the situation, and his uh, even uh, push push back the Chinese force and North Korea force of north of the uh, uh, 38th line. But uh, I'm wondering why in the uh, next year, in the 1952, uh, uh, President Truman. Uh, replaced uh, General uh, Richway uh, with uh, Mark Clark. It's strange because he, do, uh, he did pretty well. So I'm wondering why. Well, there, there are basically two, uh, two events that are key. One is the strategy had been set that you go slightly above the 30th parallel to a defensible, more defensible border and stop there and we negotiate. And Ridgeway was not going to violate that. That was his order. But MacArthur, who was sitting back in Tokyo, started making speeches and sending them to the American Legion, having them reprinted by the Republicans, by Joe Martin, of Massachusetts, reprinted in the Congressional Quarterly, which were real violations of Truman's guidelines and strategy. He had been ordered not to speak to the press, not to speak to the public about strategy. He did, so Truman fired him. At that point, there was no overall commander for UN forces. Ridgway was the commander of US forces. So Ridgway got promoted to all of MacArthur's positions, commander of UN forces, commander of regional Far East, et cetera. Uh, and Mark Clark, who had been scheduled to come in uh, as a Ridgeway replacement at some point, uh, took over. So it was no, uh, I mean, Ridgeway got a full star and was uh, moved back to Tokyo and the negotiations continued. So that was, uh, I just had to be satisfactory to him. Uh, MacArthur is uh, no longer on the, on the playing field. The book is Fearing the Worst. Uh, uh, Dick Betts, uh, a professor at Columbia University, says it's a masterful and definitive combination of detail, insight, new sources from both sides, and, and I can attest to this page-turning readability. So thank you, Sam, for this overview of the book. It is available for purchase outside. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your, your um, presentation today. Thank you all for joining me. Please join me. Thank you. Yeah.